Hey, good morning, Point Church. I'm Caleb Kimmel, interim pastor here at The Point, and I don't know about each of you, but maybe you were the same. As a kid, I used to love summertime. I mean, come on, we're off of school, the warm weather, and I was loved playing with the other kids in the neighborhood. We'd ride our bikes up and down the cul-de-sacs. We'd play hide-and-seek well in the evening hours. We'd go explore looking for frogs in the creek. Now, that was during the days where your parents would just simply say, get home before dark. That was our alarm clock. You know, I cherish those childhood memories. But for whatever reason, I always gravitated towards baseball as a kid. Probably because my older brother, he played sports. I was always trying to keep up with him. But growing up, baseball, it became a focus of mine. And I'll be honest, it became an unhealthy fixation. The reason why I say that is how I performed in baseball, my goals, my aspirations, they really began in my mind to form my identity. What I placed my self-worth in, it became an idol in my life. I just didn't realize it. And yeah, I took pride in my school and, you know, I was expected to get good grades and that was fine. But still sports, that aspect, it far outweighed everything else. But friends, as that played out in my life over the years, it created a monumental moment of transition in my life. See, I was playing baseball at Valparaiso University. It was my senior year of college and we're playing Southern Utah University in Oklahoma. And it's the conference tournament and, and something happened. You know, what happened was the final out in the final play of the final game happened. And when that last out was made, friends, in that moment, I was no longer a baseball player. I was no longer a student. Both of those came to an abrupt end. I didn't know what I was. What I was in was a transition. You know, life is full of transitions and it makes it challenging, especially since approximately 70% of people don't like change. In fact, you at your computer screen, raise your hand if you don't like change. Yep, we probably have about 75, 70% right there. You know, it's called transition. And you and I, we might be standing in the middle of a transition in our life right now. And, you know, we might be confused from time to time on why we're there. But really, a transition, it's where God is simply ready to move you from one level to the next level. And transition, I'll tell you what, many times it's not a fun place to be. But it's often a place that makes you call on God. It's often a place where you give God a little bit more attention and influence in your life. And friends, that is a good place to be. And I don't know about you, but often when times are good, I kind of put God on the back burner. I start to shift into a mode where I feel a little more independent, almost like, hey, you know, I can do this on my own. But when transition occurs, it's a reminder that, look, we need to pause and allow God to redirect our path. And today, friends, I want to walk us through four biblical truths that will bring us hope during transition. You know, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you would have heard the news that our lead pastor, Ray Harris, has retired, at least from Sunday morning teaching portion. Friends, he's still working hard on behalf of our church behind the scenes, and we absolutely know God is still going to be using Ray and Lisa in extraordinary ways as they move through their own transition. But that means, church, that we're in transition. But friends, that's okay. See, we believe God is absolutely preparing to move this congregation from one level to the next level. You know, in Ephesians 1.11, the Bible tells us, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and makes everything work out according to his plan. Now, notice the beginning of that verse. It says, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ. I want to emphasize the united with Christ. See, we're not just a group of people doing something on our own here. We are a people united by Jesus, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. See, the first biblical truth that we can place our hope in during transition is that God will be with this church at all times. You know, God makes everything work according to his plan. And I'm pretty sure when the Bible says everything, that our own point church right here, we're part of that category. So really the question is not who is in control, you know, God is in control. The question is, will you and I have a confidence in him by trusting him? Will we trust that he's in control and he's preparing our congregation to move from one level to the next level? You know, it kind of reminds me of, of a Seinfeld episode. Any Seinfeld fans out there watching with us today? You know, there's a Seinfeld episode where George and Jerry, you know, they're in Jerry's apartment. They're just talking about some mundane, ordinary things. And then Kramer comes flying in. We know Kramer's personality. And, and Kramer, he shouts, he goes, hey, who wants to have some fun? And George and Jerry, their eyes light up with excitement. And they say, I do, I do. And then Kramer says, do you really want to have some fun? Or are you just saying you want to have some fun? And Jerry says, I really want to have some fun. And George says, nah, I was just saying I want to have some fun. You know, really, the question is, do you trust God? 
or are you just saying you trust God? See, if you trust God, guess what happens? You'll do what he says. No matter how foolish or impossible it may seem, you'll trust him and, and lean in on this, friends. You'll leave the results to him. Now, if you're like George and you're just saying something, right? If you're just saying that you trust God, you'll probably pull back some resources. Maybe that's financial or relational. You'll focus them more on yourself. You'll, you'll hold on to whatever it is that's going to help you find some false sense of security and will slide back and do things your own way. Now, church, there's a reason why we want to avoid that. See, it's biblical truth number two. See, God plans good out of transition. It's the second biblical truth. God plans good out of this transition we're in right now. And we don't want to miss what he has in store for the next chapter here at the point. You know, it might not feel good right now, but Romans 8.28 tells us this. It says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. <laughs> Once again, I'm pretty sure, friends, that the Point Church is included in all things. Therefore, you can rest assured that good will come from this. That's how awesome God is. Even though those things don't feel good, they can still be used for good. It might not be the good that you and I have in mind, but it is good. Therefore, we need to walk forward together in faith. Remember this unhealthy fixation of, of baseball of mine that I mentioned? Well, it really emerged in my junior year of high school. See, now your junior year, that's a big recruitment year for a lot of athletes trying to make decisions on where they want to play college baseball. And my close buddy, he was being recruited by all the big schools. He'd eventually get drafted right out of high school. He ended up playing in the MLB. And I was working my tail off trying to keep up with him. But something happened. I was playing basketball at a different friend's house. It was in October. And I went up to block a shot on a fast break. And I reached out my right arm and I felt something pop. I didn't really know what happened. I just knew that my right shoulder was in a lot of pain and I, and I couldn't lift it at all. I was sitting on the sidelines for a while, not knowing what was going on. Well, come to find out, I dislocated my right throwing shoulder. Then come to find out, I have to have surgery on it. That was a moment where I felt like my world was collapsing. This was my junior year, my big recruitment year, and now I have season-ending injury that requires shoulder surgery. And I felt like all my hopes of a future college career were over. Now remember, I had placed my identity in this sport to a very unhealthy extent, and, but here's what happened. You know, it was a struggle. It was a big transition for me. The surgery, it went well. I rehabbed like crazy. I went on to have a successful summer season. Fortunately, I got recruited, played college baseball. I went on to have a very mediocre subpar college career. Nothing amazing there, but here's what my point is. After I was done, I began to realize something. That injury, it led to perseverance. The struggle and the transition, it was preparing me for something. You know, after college was over, I began working with young people. And immediately there was a connection there because of my struggle. I could relate to them. I could connect with them. I could share with them my own setbacks. You know, it led to serving over 7,000 kids a year through ministry opportunities. And if I had not walked forward in faith, I would have missed something bigger God was preparing me for. He used those injuries, those struggles for good. It was definitely not the good I had in my mind. But boy, did God show up as I walked forward in faith. You know, the very early roots of this church were founded in faith. We launched a church in a movie theater, and a month or two before our very first Sunday at the Rave Movie Theater, the ownership group came and told us, hey, look, sorry, we can't do a sublease contract with you. <laughs> well, friends, we walked forward in faith then, and God showed up in mighty ways. With no real effort at all at our end, God showed up and led that ownership group to change course, change their mind, and we moved forward in faith then. We move forward in faith now. Now, biblical truth number three, while good will come out of this pastoral transition, that doesn't remove the temporary sadness. Look, losing your pastor, it hurts. You know, Ray has served as a mentor of mine for 15 years. He's invested in my life. He's trusted me and my family with areas of ministry that we did not feel equipped for. And he's been there for us in the good times and the rough times. And so, friends, I want you to understand biblical truth number three, it's okay to grieve. You know, I'm reminded of, of how the Ephesian elders, how they wept at Paul's goodbye. In Acts 20, it says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down, he prayed with them, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul, they kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he had spoken, and that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now, one small discrepancy in comparison is that Pastor Ray is probably not heading to his death. He's going to have some great ministry opportunities. Um, but you know what? I too believe that the Ephesians, they knew that God would be with them, that he was in control, that he was going to bring good out of this transition. Nevertheless, they wept. It's okay to weep. It's actually a way of saying thank you to both God and our pastor. 
You know, that's why we celebrated last Sunday with a retirement party, to show our appreciation even amongst the grieving process. But friends, biblical truth number four, it tells us that we can have hope during transition in the form of a challenge for us. You know, this challenge is, guess what? The ministry must go on. Notice the Great Commission, it does not say, therefore, go and make disciples if your pastor Ray Harris is still preaching on Sunday morning. I love Ray, but his name ain't the Bible, friends. You know, but what Ray did beautifully is what Ephesians 4.12 tells us. It says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. You know, the Great Commission doesn't have an asterisk next to it. The ministry must go on. But does ministry become a bit harder without a lead pastor? You know, probably so. But if he was a good pastor, and Ray absolutely was, he will have obeyed Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 by equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So in the interim, you and I, friends, we are the church. We are called to move the ministry forward. So let's get to work. Let's look for areas to serve. Spend time in prayer. Continue to give and help fuel and fund the mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. Those are the things that will continue to help prepare this church for our next chapter of impact. But there is a warning. I think the Bible gives us a warning. We see this in Matthew 26, 31. It says, Then Jesus said to them, talking to his followers, You will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, Jesus, he promised the flock would scatter at his crucifixion. And for a short time, this is what happened to Jesus' followers. But look, they were scared. They were confused. They didn't fully understand at that time what Jesus had been sharing with them during his earthly ministry leading up to his death. But friends, you and I, we're in a whole different position. By the grace of God's word, we know that Jesus conquered the grave. We know how the story has played out. The warning is that during a transition, the church must not scatter. It's a common theme to to many churches during pastoral transition because their pastor is no longer there. Or if an area of ministry, maybe it begins to lag a little bit. Some folks might trickle out. And some reasons for going might be legitimate, but this may also be the time, congregation, that we should most strongly come together, right, for support and encouragement. I would love to challenge us today with three things in response to this warning. Number one, just recognize there's a temptation to scatter. Just recognize it. There's a temptation because of the unknown. Now, I love how Paul, he addresses this temptation with the Church of Corinth. You know, he is seeing this temptation within the people to divide or get caught up in what leaders they should align with and who they should follow. Now, at this time, this church was made up of very young believers, and they had lots of disagreements as they were just beginning to understand Jesus' teaching, which were completely countercultural to everything they had been taught growing up. So there were plenty of distractions taking place. Well, I guess similar today, we could probably compete with any past generation in regards to distractions. We got news media 24-7, social media, constant text, emails, kids' schedules. In fact, just the other night, Chris and my wife and I, we had four scheduling commitments at the exact same time in four different locations, and we only have three kids. I didn't think that was mathematically possible, but it's, it's common for any of us to get caught up in distractions. Look, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. It says, what after all is Apollos? Now, Apollos, he was one of the teachers in the church of Corinth. And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord had assigned to each task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. You know, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's humbly kind of making fun of himself. See, Paul addresses their temptation to scatter based on who to follow. And he immediately, he redirects their thinking away from the human leader division and he directs it back onto Jesus Christ. You know, Paul was sharing, look, don't let your appreciation for your pastor, your appreciation for a teacher or leader lead us into division. Rather, allow us to focus to remain on Christ and the unity that he desires. In fact, that's our second challenge. You know, friends, let's work more diligently, now more than ever before, to stay bound together in unity and love. Colossians 3.14, it says, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Friends, be the ultimate encourager during this time of transition. However that looks to you, be the encourager to others. God is absolutely preparing the point church for great things to come. And challenge number three, look for unmet needs that you can help meet. You know, Hebrews 13, 16, it says, Do not forget to do good and to share with others for such sacrifices God is pleased. Look, friends, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the world. And that relationship should convict us and motivate us to look around at the needs that you and I can help meet. 
God is pleased when he sees his children working in unity, loving on each other, and helping others in their time of need. Look for unmet needs that you can help meet right where you're at. God has wired you with the unique gifts, abilities, and talents for such a time as this. Be willing to step out of your comfort zone and look to help meet needs that are not being met. You know, this will be a season of testing for all of us. And I know he didn't ask for it, but with God's help, look, we're going to endure it. We're going to grow through it. And I promise you, a new chapter of impact is going to unfold here at the Point Church. You know, let me share a little story with you, though. Friends, just a few days ago, something happened that that really hit me pretty hard. I was here at the Point Church wrapping up a staff meeting. By the way, we have an awesome staff full of sincere hearts that care about you, care about this community. We have awesome volunteers who are serving faithfully week in and week out. It's an absolute honor to work alongside all of you. But after the staff meeting, I had to go pick up something for my kids. So I'm driving from the church to a local school and I pull up to an intersection and there's a car in front of me with a bumper sticker. Now, I can't really read what it says because it's one of those bumper stickers where all the letters were kind of smashed together with no spaces in between. I think there's a hashtag at the beginning. But I did see that it starts with Jesus. So it got my attention. And it's taken me a few moments to run through the different scenarios of options on the rest of the letters and what they're supposed to say. The light's still red, so it gave me a few more seconds to try and decipher the words. And then I figured it out. It said, Jesus is a myth. And immediately it evoked two emotional responses from me. First, Part of me wanted to race up to their door and put on my analytical hat and begin an intellectual conversation about the historical evidence that supports Jesus' claim of being God or the evidence of the resurrection. There's a ton of it. Discuss the mathematical probability of prophecies being fulfilled or how I don't understand randomness of evolution could ever lead to sophisticated design. You know, that's the head part of me. But another part of me was the heart side. My heart just sank because I started thinking, you know, what happened to this individual What life hurts or confusion or broken promises or damaged relationships occurred for someone to stop what they're doing, seek out a message like Jesus is a myth, invest money in buying it, place it on your car strategically as the key message you wanted the rest of the world behind you to see. You know, it hurt my heart. Now, I don't know if what their story was. I don't know if it was a joke. I don't know if it was out of anger. I don't know if there's some other meaning to it, but here's what I do know, church. That car was driving down our streets, living in our neighborhoods, maybe as a young person in our schools. We have people watching from all over the world. This could have easily been someone in your own town. And friends, they need to know the real Jesus. They need to know God's love. They need to have someone show up who cares and speaks in their life. Friends, they need one of us. Our communities are full of hurting people who need to know what a relationship with a loving God really means, what it really looks like. Our communities are full of individuals being distracted by busy schedules, increasing demands in the workplace, and discontented people looking for hope. Friends, we have people in our own backyard that are shouting out to us, we need purpose, we need hope. Allow the Point Church to be that hope. Let us avoid the temptation to scatter. Allow us to unite in encouragement and love and allow us to help reach those far from God to help them find and follow Jesus. Friends, can we unite and do that together? Let me pray for us this Sunday. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, for the opportunities for us to come together. Lord, as the Point Church, as followers all over the world, uh, tuning in, watching this, Lord, weekly. Lord, allow us to to be united in who we are in you. Allow us to be bold, uh, Lord, for you. And let's take to heart those challenges, Lord. Allow us to avoid the temptation to scatter. Allow us to unite together, working together, and allow us to look and seek out unmet needs and help bring close people closer to you, Lord. We know you are a big God. You are in control, and you have amazing things planned for us, Lord. Be with us. Encourage us. Lead us, Lord, as we enter this next week. It's your that we pray. Amen. Hey there, thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.